Hi there, how you doing? Hope you're having a great day. Now, I'm pretty sure you would agree that now more than ever, our children really need us to be their place of calm, confidence and safety. You know, it's our responsibility as parents, grandparents and carers to be that person that makes them really emotionally feel this and also to provide a space that children can feel safe and se secure to be and live within. You know, I don't, don't, I don't know about you, but I've always viewed home really as a sanctuary. It doesn't really matter what's going on in the outside world, it only matters what's really going on within your four walls and your roof. Now, I personally felt this many years ago when I lived in London, um, and for anyone that's really lived in a major city like that knows that that fast paced feeling and that chaotic energy that a big city has. It really has you continuously living in a high adrenalized state. And this is much like our lives right at the moment. You know, we, we all know this feeling at the moment that a day feels like a week and a week feels like a month. And the reason for this feeling is that we have so much adrenaline and fear that's running through our bodies. It's the fight or flight response that we are continuously have turned on um, that keeps our bodies alert. Um, it's not healthy for us to live in this state and or to have children exposed to it. And as we know that children really are intuitive creatures um, and they really feel what we feel so now more than ever we need to switch out out of this like the stressful state and ensure that we're communicating to our children that they are under no immediate danger and that their family and everyone that they love is in their home will be safe during this challenging time now to help talk us through how we can do this is our very special guest Chrissy Davies. Now, Chrissy brings 15 years experience in special education, <clears throat> supporting children with a wide range of social and emotion, emotion, emotional challenges. Now, she's hailed as the child charmer, and Chrissy Davies brings a heart centered approach to all of her services <laughs> and believes that understanding the causes of challenging behaviour is a first step to making lasting change. Now Christy understands, Christy, sorry, understands the power of connection and communication and knows that with the right support, families can confidently calm the chaos. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Thank you so much. Don't you love that nickname, the child charmer? I know. I Where it. did you get that? Uh, some of my clients, well, first it was the parent whisperer and then it was moved to the child charmer, which I actually love. And I guess it's one of those things, Rach, you know, when you spend as much time around children as me, they start to rub off on you. You know what I mean? And so over that, you know, incredible career that I've had working with children and families, I've just got a really um, unique and amazing insight into how children's brains work, how they operate, how to get the best from them. And that now is really the core of my work is that I just want to share all of those skills and that knowledge with as many families as I can so that they can view their children through the same lens as me. Yes, that's brilliant. Well, we've got heaps to talk about today. To yeah. begin with, we published your article titled Within These Four Walls. So for someone who hasn't read the article, can you give us a little bit of an overview of what it's about and just what inspired you to write it? <clears throat> yeah, of course. I just, I obviously kept seeing out in the media, everybody freaking out about all, you know, everything that's happening and especially parents in particular worrying about homeschooling their children. You know, the schools closing and all that sort of stuff led to a lot of fear for a lot of families. And as somebody who's worked from home for a long time, you know, and an experienced educator, I guess I just did not have the same sense of fear because I already had my head around a lot of that sort of stuff. But, you know, I understand that that's really foreign to a lot of people. And so that's what really inspired me to write the article is I really want people to know you already have the skills. You already know what your children need. You just have to recognise it. Yes, yes. Mm. Well, let's get stuck into the questions because I think everything else will be covered as, um, as a result of the answers you're going to yes. give us. So, Yay. number one, in your article, you talk about a honeymoon period for our children. Can you explain mm. further? Absolutely. So, the honeymoon period is obviously, you know, we talk about when we go on the honeymoon, it's all lovey-dovey and happy days and cocktails on the beach. But then the reality sets in once you actually live with somebody 24-7. We see it a lot with young children when a new sibling comes along, you know, when there's any big changes made within families. Children generally go into what we call a honeymoon period. 
starting a new school, anything like that. When kids start school, often parents will say to me, oh, you know, they were fantastic for the first two weeks. And then all of a sudden, she's got real. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, what happens with our children is once they, especially with all this stuff that's been happening, all of a sudden, dad's working from home, you know, mum's not as available as, as she normally would be, or I'm not getting to see my friends, or I'm stuck at home with a sibling who I'm not used to being around all the time. You know, we can either, what happens generally with our children is they go into a honeymoon period where we, we sort of get lulled into a false sense of security that they're doing okay. And then once they sort of realise, like especially with siblings, this baby ain't going anywhere, then we can start to see their behaviour really unravel because they feel safe, they feel secure enough for them to actually be their true selves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one of the most backhanded compliments we can have as parents with our children. We get the worst from our children because we are the people that make them feel the safest. So children often hold behaviours in for other people in classrooms, you know, at kinder or wherever they are when we're out with our friends and all that sort of stuff. And that's why we as families see the worst of our children's behaviour within the family home. Um, and the most important thing to remember about that honeymoon period is to be prepared for it yeah. and understand why it's happening. And what your children need at the, at the end of that honeymoon period is stability and consistency. Okay. So <clears throat> how long generally do you think families would be experiencing a honeymoon period at the moment? I, I teach families about the two-week rule. Two weeks is a, a pretty good amount of time for your children to understand that change is happening. It, it gives them time to understand that things are different, that we're moving in a different direction or that things, and you talked a little bit about energy in your intro and I am huge on energy and positive energy in the family home. Do not underestimate how much that impacts on our children's behaviour. It is phenomenal. So, you know, all that sort of stuff, we, we, I think sometimes we have our expectations on our children are that they should just get it straight away and that they should just understand, okay, dad's working from home for, for how long, but they just don't work that way. Their brains don't allow them to think that far ahead. You know, they're not developed enough. And so we have to have a really good um, insight and education in understanding why that is. Mm -hmm. And the behaviours that they are likely to display as they're transitioning out of this honeymoon period, in your experience, do you think they're more likely to be characteristic, or characteristic to who they are or uncharacteristic because we are in such a unique scenario? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think what, what happens is we tend to see, like I can, I put my hand up, my kids have been fighting non-stop. We've been at home for seven days and they have been fighting non-stop because they're not used to being around each other all the time. They're fighting over toys that haven't seen the light of day for two years. You know, all those sorts of really what I call minor but annoying behaviours start to come out in our children. And they really struggle because they don't have the skills to always know how to sort out those situations ourselves. But what I actually saw in my own children over the weekend was the shift. I started to see the shift in energy. I started to see them communicating better. I started to see them getting along. My hubby and I were more relaxed. We sort of, you know, we call it finding our groove, don't we? You know, we're sort of finding our new groove and we're in temporary, we're in temporary, but I think one of the things we need to think about is um, we don't know how long this is going to last for. So we're also creating a new sense of safety, I suppose, and environment and experience for our children without really knowing how long it's going to last for. And no one's got a textbook on this. No one's been through it before. Everyone no. at this point is just sort of just, we're just feeling our way through it. It's like, you know. Absolutely. Parenthood, yeah. there's no manual, um, but it is a matter of just keeping up to date with, um, you know, expert information and advice and speaking to experts like yourself to be able to twist the stuff. Mm. But lots of other stuff to talk about. So let's get stuck into question number two. Now, what advice do you have for families who are now trying to work from home for the very first time? Well, as somebody who has worked from home for five years and my hubby works from home and I know you do too, Rach, so it is, there is no doubt about it, it is hard work to get much done with children around. That's, it is, that is just the reality because they don't understand, young children in particular, 
we, they find the boundaries very, very difficult. So the more explicit we can make for them, the better. I would absolutely recommend if you can and you have the space to set up a temporary home office, even if that means moving your bed in the master bedroom so you can set up a desk in there that is away from the family living area because it's very grey. It's still so interwoven. Um, and, you know, take it from me. when I can guarantee you the minute my hubby and I both come down to our, our home office, we've got two beautiful little people following us and, you know, they just want to be wherever we are in the house. So setting up that clear space I think is incredibly important if you can do it. Um, another thing that I speak to families about, I remember a family that I worked with, the mum was a baker and she used to do all these beautiful home baked biscuits and of course it was just in their kitchen. And so one of the things we implemented with that family, which was a very clear signal to her children, was a uniform. So she put on her apron, she put on her badge, she put on some things that identified to her children, mummy is working. Yes. You know, so such a simple thing for children to understand, but trust me, it makes sense because children really respond well when they know the rules. They really respond well when they know what the expectations are and having those really clear boundaries are really important for our kids. Yep. The other thing that I would absolutely recommend if both of you are still having to hold down a job <laughs> and support your children through this time is that you have to work in shifts. One of you has to try to be available emotionally, spiritually, physically for your children while the other person works in bursts to get as much work done as they can, say, in a two-hour block. Yep. And then we want to rotate if we can because I know that's not always possible and I know in some businesses, you know, people on call and all that sort of stuff. But the, the reality is if one person stays down in the office constantly working, working, working while the other person, you know, sort of supports the children, eventually both of you are going to burn out. And, you know, we all know we're parents. <laughs> Having the children is like three full-time jobs. And so I truly believe that it's not fair on one person to carry the load of supporting the children through this time. Yep. Yeah, I think it's incredibly important. But I also think it's really important that our children feel that from both of us, yep. that they see both of us taking turns. Do you know what I mean? And working in those bursts is really good and taking a break. Coming out, connecting with the kids, even if it's to have lunch. Or, you know, one of the things that I often do, I'm an early bird, so I actually get up early, bang out a couple of hours work, and then I'm always present for breakfast. Yes. You know what I mean? And so you're touching in with your children at various points throughout the day rather than just locking yourself away or sticking the TV on all day and expecting them to sit there and watch TV while you get your work done. Because I can guarantee you, we sort of talked about this in the intro, the more you push them away, the more they're going to annoy you. Yep. You know, the more they're going to interrupt you. So I shouldn't say annoy you, but the more they're going to be seeking out that connection. And so if we can try to um, schedule in those various touch points for our kids throughout the day, they're going to feel emotionally connected to us. They're going to still feel heard. They're still going to feel listened to and that you're invested in them. You know what I mean? And so they're actually going to be happier to possibly, depending on the age, play a little bit more independently. Yep, which, mm. is, which is important for their, for their development also. Um, Absolutely. Developing their imagination depending as you said, on, on their age. So, so what I'm hearing is that, A, it's important to be able to create a, a, a definite um, area within, that, within the home that is your work area if you don't already have one. The second yes. one is to be able to create some level of structure by what you're wearing. So um, for the parent, equally for the children, they know that if mummy and daddy are in, in work clothes, um, which we should be doing anyway, but even more so that they understand that mummy and daddy are working um, and are uh, in work mode. Uh, the yes. third thing is you had mentioned that the parents should be um, doing a tag team with, with shifts with regards to, so there's always a, pa a parent that is present um, and to be able to, to, to swap and, and, and do that. Um, so is there anything else that I missed? Well, no, I was just going to add on to that. I was going to say, because the reality is, the, 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 I mean, we've spoken about this. Is This is a very unique situation we're in. We're not going to have to do this forever. But if we can try to remember that, you know, thinking that I always advocate for children and families because what the 
if we want to go far in this isolation game, you know, we've got to be looking at the big picture. And if the reality is we end up like this for a few months, we have to have a real strategy around how we're approaching our family work life going forward, you know, over the next couple of months. And so I think that that's really important for our children to have a plan, um, that we have a plan that we're clear and confident about. Because when we're clear and confident, they will respond so much better. Yeah, 100%. Mm. So let's get stuck into question number three. You've titled the article Within These Walls. What are some of the common challenges you see when working with families that occur within the family home? And what advice can you give to families to support them during this time when we're all stuck in isolation with no end in sight? <laughs> yeah, it is without a doubt. When I'm working with families one-to-one, -one, you know, over the last six years I've been in my consulting business, 100% of children's behaviour is the worst in the family home, where they feel safe and secure with their trusted adults. And so the reality is we're going to be stuck at home. You know, normally, I know even with us, the kids get a bit hairy. We're like, right, let's get out and go to the park or run around at the Oval or take the dog for a walk, you know, and all those sorts of things. And while we're actually still allowed to do exercise, we're not really, we can't really engage in those activities to diffuse our children you know, indefinitely. So we have to be thinking about other ways that we can provide our children with that structure and support whilst not leaving the house, right? Yeah. So the number one thing I want people to remember is that children have very limited capabilities to understand time. You know, we, we were joking about this, that we've only been in isolation for a week, yet it feels like a month. Can you imagine what that feels like for a child who really doesn't even understand what day it is yet? You know, um, young children in particular, and when I say young, I mean under 12, yeah? You, people think when I say young, I mean two or three, but if you know as much about the brain as me, you know that in terms of their development, they have got so far to go in understanding the world. And time especially is incredibly difficult for children. Yeah. So one of the things that I really, really encourage families to do, and I do this regardless of whether we're in isolation or it's the weekend or school holidays, is I always provide some kind of structure for my children. A loose structure, a loose plan. You know, um, in, the, in the last week, I'd been planning three activities a day that were manageable for my right. children. One in the morning, one, you know, after lunchtime, then we do another one and then we have snack and then we do another one and then they were sort of on their own. A bit of free play, a bit of downtime in there, you know, all those sorts of things that we can do as families. But we have to give them structure. If children just do not respond well when they are left to their own devices without any guidance um, or support around what's expected of them and things that they can do or games that they can play, they find those things very, very challenging. And so the more we can support our kids with that structure, the better they will respond. Yes. We spoke about disconnection. And I know in, in this sort of time, it's really tempting to stick your kids on an iPad or put a movie on. Um, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't do that, but just be really mindful about how much you're allowing your children to engage in those activities. Yeah. Because while it might work in the moment, I can guarantee you the ramifications of that or the fallout of too much technology, I mean, there's so much research around this, is that it will increase the challenging behaviour long term. Yeah. So it's something just to be mindful of. Do you know what I mean? Because I think we fall very quickly into that habit with technology. Yep. Um, the other really interesting thing that I want to mention here to, that we as adults have to be really mindful of, especially when our children are displaying challenging behaviours, is to not turn on each other. We very One of the most common things I see in families is parents not agreeing on how to manage or support children's behaviours. And that's why education to me is so incredibly important because when we've got a really good understanding of why kids do the things they do, where their behaviour is coming from, how developed their brains are, what they can actually understand conceptually, it makes the way that we respond much more positive. And when we learn that together in particular, we're sort of on the same page with it. Yes. So... I know, you know, and you, you will probably agree with this as well, you know, when the kids are a bit, bit ratty and you're stressed or tired, you tend, the person that you tend to take it out on is your trusted adult, which is your partner. Yep. 
you know, and so then what happens is that we end up creating that tension and friction in our relationship, which means then that that filters on down to our children as well and impacts on that energy for everybody. So yeah. I know it's not easy, but I think, you know, it's really important to remember that we are in this together. Yes. We have to be operating as a team more than ever. And having flexibility around that, I think, is incredibly important and being fluid. Just because it worked one day doesn't mean it will work the next. And just because it looked like this on one day doesn't mean it has to be like that the next. Yeah. And, and being adaptable and changeable, which a lot of people find really difficult. Yes. In this time is when we are really going to be needing those skills as adults to, to yes. be able to support our children and each other. Mm. Look, it's from your point of view, what is, I guess, the, the most important thing that parents should be providing for their kids at the moment? How we, how we um, as in, as in from, from themselves, I think it's emotional connection because really that is what our children need to feel daily, every day. They need to feel connected. They need to feel heard. They need to feel safe. They need to feel valued. They need to feel like they've got an, their emotional tanks filled up enough so that they don't constantly keep looking for that from us um, in negative ways, which is, you know, what we call negative connection through their behaviour. So I think one of my favourite strategies is called connect before you direct. You know, if you can try to invest in your children before asking anything of them, they respond so much better. Yes. They actually, they're actually happier to do it for you, you know. So... Um, if you've got you've got something that you need to go down to the office to do, try sitting and reading a story first and then saying, you know, this was really great. I love spending time with you. I've just got to go down to the office to do X, Y and Z. Um, you know, your children are much more likely to actually listen to you and allow you to have that time if you've made time for them first. Yes. Um, and so you would say that they would really need to know what's happening each day at home and most importantly what's expected from them. Is that what you're saying? Is, is what they need most. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And young children in particular, I use a lot of visuals with children. So this morning we got out our little visuals and we put them up on the board and we made a plan, we did it together, um, you know, of the different things that we're going to do throughout the day. So it's very clear to my kids <clears throat> because it's in picture form as well. I've got a four-year-old. He can look at the board and be like, oh, great, we're doing balls because there's a picture of a ball there. Do you know what I mean? So... We want to make it as easy and as accessible to young children as we can and give them some autonomy over that as well is incredibly important. Okay, mm. and how, how are you giving them? So if you're providing the structure and you're giving mm. them three um, activities per day and depending on their age, we've got distant learning now um, as well, how do you provide the autonomy to them when we are providing structure and they need the structure? Well, so for example, I, uh, t I'm teaching families throughout this time as well through my um, online educational behaviour support group to plan open-ended activities, which means any child of any age can engage in the activity. It's one activity, but it can be, you know, interpreted by a 12-year-old, a 4-year-old and a 1-year-old who can, you know, wiggle along on the, on the ground if they're crawling yet, but because that's the only way we're going to get through this. Yep. You know, um, try, trying to come up with activities that our kids can all engage in at their own level. That's really important. So, like with mine this morning, when I'm choosing the activities, even though I've got a, a sort of an idea about how I want it to go, I put them all out and I, I sort of say to the kids, okay, well, we could do this and we could do this. And if they go, yay, let's do that, I say, okay, let's do that. Do you know what I mean? And so they're much more likely to actually engage in the activity if they've yep. chosen it themselves. Yep. So in your in your view, what final advice do you have for parents and carers at this at this time? I think it's really important to remember we can't do everything. We are only one person. We're only one human being. And in this particular time, we are expected to be a present parent, in some cases hold down a job and be a, a good colleague or a boss. You know, um, we have to we want to be a um, positive partner <laughs> as much as possible as well you know as well as an educator for our children and you know in yourself that is four very loaded roles yes. and to to actually expect ourselves to be able to do all of those things a hundred percent well for an extended period of time is absolutely in my opinion unachievable
it's just not possible. And so I really encourage families to think about, okay, maybe, you know, we talk about the 80-20 rule, don't we? 20%, 80% great parenting, 20% okay, our kids will still be okay. We're not emotionally damaging them. You know, we're going to lose our shoes. That's just the reality. As long as we're not losing it every single day and we're rebuilding that connection and we're digging deep again the next day, then our children are going to be fine. Yes. Um, and, I, and I think it's just about prioritising. Our children have to be our number one priority through this as much as possible and then priori prioritising the other things. Um, you know, also, I think also even making a list of things we can let go of. Like for me, I have totally let go of the mess. My house is like a bomb site, right? Because we've got kids home all day. Kids are messy. They make mess. They're creative. They play. They build stuff. They cut stuff. They just leave stuff everywhere, right? And as much as I, you know, try to create that really calm, clean, ordered home for that energy, during this time, that is something, I mean, I'm not going to let the house go to complete ruin, but that, that is something that I'm really letting go of because that's just the reality of having people home full time in your house. It's going to get trash, right? Yes. So I think that's part of those, part of those internal workings, Rach, is working out, okay, what can you let go of for now? Love it's that. not forever. It's for now. It's, it, it, it doesn't mean we have to live like this forever. It's temporary. We're in a moment in time. We're doing the best that we can in this moment. Yep. Um, and, and, and just for just, just going easy on ourselves, I think is incredibly important. Oh, hundred percent for parents just to trust in themselves. You know, at the end of the day, they've brought kids this far, um, and the chances are that really under their care and 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 love, the children are going to absolutely thrive. But I think at this stage, it's more so. Um, so it's something that's popped up on my screen. I've got one of my staff trying to actually get into <laughs> something at the moment. Um, but yeah, the, the, the children are going to thrive. Well, thank you so much for, like, for providing us with your strategies today. And I have absolutely no doubt that your insight, um, that parents are really going to um, work to be able to find that harmonious household for all the family members. And now if parents have got any questions for you, whereabouts can they find you? So I'm online. I hang out on Instagram, Chrissy Chaos to Come, and I've got a Facebook page as well. They're very different platforms, but you'll actually see me in real life more on Instagram. I've also got an incredible online course that people can access if they are having challenges around their children. I, I sort of touched on before, I've set up a homeschool behaviour support group just temporarily to give some people guidance and support. I'm just sharing in there all the things that I'm doing with my kids and people are popping questions in about challenging behaviour that they're having. Um, I sort of figure it's the least I can do during this time to help people um, get through this moment. Um, and I guess it's one of those things too, I'm, I'm always really passionate about parents seeking out quality education around their children and understanding that they're not deliberately trying to drive us nuts, <laughs> you know, and I think when we learn about them and how they operate, it just gives us a lot more empathy and guidance into how to respond to them. So. Yes. Yeah, there's lots of different ways we can seek out education around our kids. Mm. And, and we've got the article, which we're going to have the link to. We have mm. all the links at the bottom as well. So grateful for your time today. And I really hope we have an opportunity whilst we're in this isolation state that we have another opportunity for another chat in the, in the coming week. Yeah, great. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Great.